Um, I'm Cristina Venegas, um, Lynn Cruz, Miguel Coyula, um, and welcome back um, because we figured out this afternoon that it's been a long time. Yes. But he's been here before. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been like six years. Um, More or less. And thank you for letting us share the film here. Oh, with no, you. my God. So. Um, the film, um, this film that we just watched, um, it's, it's been called a documentary. You call it a documentary. And it's the first time, it's the first time that you've um, worked um, in that genre. But I think we can see that you're doing something quite interesting with that form. Um, and um, so it's, it's, you know, I see it as your intention to document a testimony in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Rafael Alcides' testimony, and, and as I was just watching it, um, his voice, his, his, his words are so, they're, they're everywhere. They they're, they're really envelop the film um, and take over in such an interesting way, in, in the way that he talks. Is, is also so precise, so descriptive at times, so um, profoundly sad at times. Um, and, but anyway, you have also produced films and shorts in, in, in science fiction. Um, since the late 1990s, you've worked in all sorts of genres. You did um, adaptations from literary works, uh, memories of overdevelopment, which is what we did here last time. Um, and you're still working on a project, on a new project um, called Blue Heart. Um, and in Cruz is an actor, producer, writer, um, works in theater and film across different genres as well. Um, and you started working together, I believe, around 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and so now mm -hmm. you're working with someone because you've always worked alone. Yeah. <laughs> so that's also really yeah. interesting. And, um, and so I've, I've been really thinking about, um, you know, how the two of you are working together in this film as well, and as well as the significance of her role as alongside um, Alcides. Um, so um, one of the things that I wanted to um, think about in this trajectory is that this film is also a deepening of a political style of filmmaking. Um, not all your films, I mean, Memories of Overdevelopment obviously does, um, but some of the earlier films are not quite as direct in this way. Um, they're, they're going there, but um, so that's something um, that's really interesting. And it is quite clearly a political film. Um, and and um, one that's also you're working with um, how Alcides, you know, sees the revolution and, and what happened to him. Um, so is, is he, and, and so I want to talk a little bit about Alcides. He's so interesting. And he passed away this past year. He, he, he was mm -hmm. 85 and had been battling cancer for a long time. Yeah. So this is an incredible kind of last memoir of his. Um, so is, how is Alcides unique for his own generation? He was like the generation of the 50s as mm -hmm. a writer, as a novelist and a, and a poet. How was he <coughs> unique in that way? Well, for me, um, I'll, like you said, I never made a documentary before, but having a figure like Alcides, who's so honest and has such a wide range of emotions, uh, precisely because I, I never really liked talking head documentaries, but with him, I felt I needed to make an exception because it's not just his voice, it's the way he speaks, the way he moves his arms, the way he he conveys emotion it, when talking about uh, an infinity of subject matters. Uh, he's very unique in the sense that having believed in the revolution and then grown disappointed, he's not afraid to share that in front of a camera, which many people of his uh, generation do, but only in private circles, not share it with the rest of the world. And in that sense, his honesty, 
at least for me, he's the only person I know from his generation in Cuba that has that capacity. And so how does it come about that you sit down to talk to him? And, and I, I think you've said you have like 40 hours recorded. Yes. Um, and, and Lynn, I, I will translate. Please, mm -hmm. whatever you want to say is. Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm going to speak in Spanish because I feel more, more comfortable. Um, gracias por, por la oportunidad, porque la película, a pesar de que fue pensada para la audiencia cubana, es la que no ha podido verla, o sea, así reunidos en una sala de cine como aquí. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the film obviously um, has not been able to be seen by the audience for, for one of the audiences for which it was made for, which was a Cuban audience like we're doing here. Eh, sobre todo porque la manera en que Alcides habla es muy clara, eh, algo que, que, que es difícil encontrar, como decía Miguel, En, en Cuba, eh, sobre todo esa generación de revolución. Y también quería decir que la película, esta película, eh, siempre pienso que fue como un accidente, en el sentido de que estábamos en el, en el rodaje de Corazón Azul, la otra película que estamos haciendo ahora, Ciencia Ficción, y Miguel se fracturó una, una pierna, y entonces ahí eh, surgió la idea de, en ese momento, de entrevistar al CIDES, y de pronto, lo que fue una serie web, se convirtió en este documental. So, let me backtrack a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> See, she talks just as fast as he does. Um, um, as he, the, one of the things that's unique uh, for her is that he's very direct in the way that he speaks, and so that was also very um, unique about um, you know his particular persona, his particular tra trajectory. But it's also um, there was this opportunity at one point. Um, for them to be able to shoot this because Miguel had an accident and hurt his leg and so suddenly there was this opportunity that they could do this film together um, while he was hurt and it began as a web series. Porque es una, una, la producción es muy sencilla en el sentido de que es eh, él y una, es una tela negra, es una, una pantalla. It's a very simple production. Um, it's a back, black background and, and I'll see this sitting in front of it so it was so you have about 40 hours of the first uh, it all started uh, uh, the first interview was four hours long and by the end of the first interview and we just started talking about whatever we, I didn't have a clear idea I just wanted I knew I wanted to record him on camera by the end of those, that first interview he told me the story about a prostitute mm -hmm. which appears in the beginning and that's when it all clicked to me that it had to be the story of the revolution and, and then the rest of the interviews started going in that direction and that's how. For a whole year we were interviewing him, uh, either in my place or at his place. He don't, we don't live too far from each other. And, um, and yes, basically because I had an accident and I couldn't walk, I wanted to do a film that I could basically shoot at home. <laughs> Uh, not, uh, <laughs> uh, although then when I got better, we went out to take some shots of the city and all that, but in general, most of it was uh, at home. And the idea was to have him on camera as much time as possible. And uh, of course, sometimes I have to cut because I have to uh, weave all those 40 hours of interviews, but the style was to have him without cut and instead of cutting away to illustrate having those fictional uh, elements and animation happen behind him or in front of him so that I wouldn't lose the flow of his inner monologue because the, the film, I, I wanted it to be like a, like a subject, going into his subjectiveness of the story. Not having interview other people talking about him, but just basically going inside mm -hmm, his mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in those interviews, or when you first started interviewing him, aside from um, the story about um, the prostitute and the revolution and that sort of, what else did you learn about him that surprised you? Well, uh, it's funny because I know him since I'm a little boy because he's married to my cousin. <laughs> so I've been visiting his home all the time and uh, I read one, uh, a book, the book Nadia, I read it when I was 16 and uh, it's interesting because for my generation that was the book of Alcides that we knew, but for other uh, previous generations he's, he's had an impact on uh, he, had, he has the book uh, Pata de Palo and Agradecido Como Un Perro, which are also very significant. That, that, those books were actually people that were in jail were trading them for cigarettes. 
there was a, a raft, a Cuban rafter that left Cuba and took uh, the book Agradecido como un perro with him on a raft. <laughs> uh, so yes, he's, uh, uh, but he's been out of the public light for, uh, he, uh, since I guess the late 80s or early 90s mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. And in the late 80s too, there's a whole other group of artists who are painters, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's like this whole contestation that's going on in mm -hmm. the arts. Um, and he's sort of going underground, in, in, well not underground, but I mean he's sort of going into hiding um, or not participating. Mm -hmm. So that he's, he's like in these interesting moments historically. Um, and and all of his contradictions in terms of the re, of the revolution. Yeah, uh, that's uh, the other thing that was very interesting for me is that he was he was willing to share his contradictions and his feelings because uh, I, I always go as there's a filmmaker that once said never make a film about a subject matter that you love or hate otherwise it becomes a propaganda film only make the film if you find a subject with enough contradictions to and Alcides has that incredible honesty about it which. It's also, in Cuba, very hard to find. So I'm always fascinated with your films that I, I see them in bits and pieces. Um, mm. And this film was the same. It's like I saw some of the early, I guess I saw some of the web episodes because there mm. were five or six web episodes mm. and they were just the interview, right? right. At the very beginning. Mm. So to see it today, well, I saw it the other day, but to see it, you know, into what it becomes. At what point did you take it from uh, this web series and make it something else? Well, um, and was that an intention all along, or how did that? No, it was not an about? intention at all. It's just that several people told me after they saw the web series that, knowing that I had shot more with him, that I should make something longer, and and we shot more. Uh, hours of interviews and then did the feature, which by the way was completed in August 2016. Fidel has, uh, hadn't died yet. Right. But then after he died, uh, we were filming a scene from Blue Heart and the next day we went to film the funeral because for a minute we thought, wow, now, now he's dead. Now, uh, what are we going to do now? Because he was a character, but then I thought we have, to, we have to somehow use this in the film because it closes an era symbolically. Uh, for our series. <coughs> so uh, we began filming in November 2015 and we finished in November 2016. It was the last year of Fidel's life. Y tal vez porque comenzó siendo una serie y era se convirtió también en el el largometraje en algo episódico, ¿no? Porque durante ese tiempo en que filmábamos So it was also um, going back to the connection between the series. Um, that, that as it becomes this longer documentary was also episodic in nature. Durante ese tiempo ocurrió la visita de Obama a Cuba, o sea, todo el diálogo entre Raúl y Obama, y también fue surgiendo la necesidad de dialogar sobre eso, ¿no? Sobre cómo nos sentíamos viendo que todo el pueblo solamente hablaba de Obama y de y de cómo vestía a su esposa, o sea, cómo ese era el sentimiento colectivo. So at the same time that that was that we were doing that transformation, Obama comes to Cuba, Obama and Michelle Obama come to Cuba, and so the conversation then in Cuba is very much about Obama, about this, about what's going on, and lots of people are talking about the two of them and about Michelle and how she dresses, and so they there there was a need to really deal with how we felt um, in light of these, this, you know, of how people in Cuba were responding to <coughs> Obama's visit and what was going on. And so that became part of the film as well. Y yo creo también que po, también por ahí surgió la necesidad de, de que apareciera mi personaje, mm -hmm. porque eh, estábamos en parte también despidiendo nuestra infancia con el sueño de la justicia social, de la promesa del futuro, uh, del paraíso comunista. So. And it's also at that time that my character um, is in introduced as a way of dealing with my generation. Um, sí, nuestra, and, nuestra right, generation. their generation. Um, and as a way of dealing with that lost uh, illusion, the lost, um, what was being lost 
um, in, in different ways. Because it was interesting also that in many ways Alcides dictates the, mm -hmm. uh, the structure and many of the things that happen in the film. For example, uh, there are moments in the interview where he gets angry and starts talking as if Fidel is in front of him. And that's where I got the idea for having the cross conversation, which is something that happens to his generation and my parents' generation also, that when Fidel was talking on the television, they would get angry and talk back to him. But of course, there was no communication. Uh, and uh, yes, so many of the, that's why, because Alcides has all this range of emotions. Sometimes he gets, he talks in a fun kind of way, then he gets very grave, he gets angry, he has, he tells this almost like uh, mm -hmm. monologues from a movie actor. Uh, the monologue of the prostitute or the little boy in the sack uh, has all these pathos. Mm -hmm. Like uh, right. he, he just handles emotion in a way that uh, very few people can do in Cuba. Y una de las cosas también que pude entender es que a través de la generación del Cides, um, que también es la de mi la, de, de la generación del Cides, ah, de que también es la de mi padre. Eh, eh, por, durante, que cuando comenzó la revolución ellos tenían a Fidel muy cerca, uh -huh. porque Fidel era como el compañero que estaba eh, cerca del pueblo y en la medida en que fue pasando el tiempo se fue alejando cada vez y era inalcanzable, por eso es que también tienen esa impotencia de no, hay, de no dialogar. And another thing that I understood too um, about Alcides and his generation, which was my parents' generation, um, is that at the very beginning of the revolution, he, Fidel was somebody who was very close. He was somebody who was your, your age, your compatriot, your very close to you in that sense, and as time goes by, um, that distance becomes more and more pronounced, and, be, and Fidel becomes unreachable, untouchable, um, something completely separate from that original mm. figure that he had. Which made. is why I think mm -hmm. um, the idea for Lin's character also is that, for me, it's the story of, of, of of love and deception between two men and a woman. The two men are Alcides and Fidel, and the woman is the revolution. Uh, like Alcides says, it's like an old girlfriend, a part of you still loves her. And, um, and because in a way, I think many times Alcides is talking directly to, to Fidel. Mm -hmm. It's like an opportunity. He, he actually never gave interviews before. He never believed in giving interviews. But I, I, I guess I feel he was running out of time, because mm -hmm. he was already sick when we began. And, uh, Many of the things he's talking about are the content of the novels. He knew he was not going to have time to completely transcribe uh, to the computer. And that whole, well, a couple of things here. Um, do you identify with Alcides? A part of me, yes. Uh, another part n doesn't, but uh, the romantic part and and I, I, I believe in socialism as well. I believe in socialism in the sense that uh, you need a system that, uh, because part of, uh, in, in my youth, in my adolescence uh, and childhood, we were engraved with this idea when we were going to elementary school that uh, there was supposed to be social justice. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, and we found that, that that was a lie, that there was no social justice, we become misfits, not only of the Cuban society, but of any society we're faced with. And so um, that part of me is still, is still there and uh, I identify with Alcides in, in that regard completely. Um, <laughs> so this film was included um, in, uh, in the program at the Museum of Modern Art in New York this past year as part of uh, a program on censorship. Mm -hmm. And um, it was historical in scope so they began with PM and earlier films from the early part of the revolution um, and you know to contemporary moments and and I think one of the comments that's made um, in that program in your film obviously is included is that the number of, of censored films has increased rapidly in the last few years and in part this is connected to the fact that lots of more people are working independently and not and and working outside institutions mm. uh, or government institutions, and so um, I I think one of the thing one of the questions is because because censorship is such a complex um, topic, mm. um, and um, so do we have to understand the legacy of censorship in Cuba in order to understand what's going on today, in order mm -hmm. to understand what's happening to you 
both of you. Mm -hmm. um, Patrice mentioned at the beginning how you know, regular people are being prevented just from walking into your house or from walking into um, a, a place where the film is going to be screened. So it's a very different way of, of preventing that. So how much do we have to understand to take in what's happening now? Well, the same thing, uh, it, it's a similar pattern because by making this film, we became nobody like Alcides mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was there was a, um, a Cuban writer that wrote about this, and he predicted it when he saw the film. And it's true. It, it, uh, my mother was very scared while we were making the film because, I'm, uh, but we all knew what was coming. I mean, it, there was no way around it. There is a figure that is still sacred in Cuba, and that is Fidel Castro and Raúl Castro. Uh, you can be critical of many things, but the minute you touch them with critical eyes, that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. You become a non-person. You you don't get invited to any cultural events and um, people, the film we're making now, several actors have walked away from the film. Uh, so yes, it's very difficult even to use the cell phone to make a phone call to work something out for the film, a prop, or uh, we have to go personally to visit that person and request what we need and things like that. So, and also understanding that your film might not be screened in Cuba is also, okay. You know, this has happened before, right? People, mm. films are pulled. There's, mm. um, but yet there's something else that's going on, um, which is the fact that international entities, international festivals, international institutions mm -hmm. that now have relationships with either the film festival in Cuba, or with a Gaik, or or with some institutions, mm -hmm. that those institutions outside the U.S., uh, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry, outside Cuba, whether it's in the U.S., in Argentina, or yes. someplace else, that those institutions, too, are censoring the film. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, uh, the film was accepted at the Mar del Plata Film Festival in Argentina. We already had the acceptance email. And then uh, we had this problem with the police, and soon after they said they, they could not take the film anymore because it was not in the format they required to screen, which was a DCP format. And I said, that's, that's okay, I can make a DCP, which I made, it, I made the DCP for the screening, you can make it at home. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but they shut down communications and they, uh, we don't know exactly what happened, behind, but the tentacles are very long. And uh, this happened before, especially in Latin America, um, the Havana Film Festival has had for many years, 40 years, created a whole, structure of connections and cultural exchanges and uh, either because somebody from the Ministry of Culture calls these uh, cultural, cultural institutions or because then themselves they, they don't want to have any trouble with the Kike and the Havana Film Festival, they, they do actions like this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and I know that um, in your theater work too, that, and, and you have been censored from your own membership in the Actors Guild, right? Oh, um, so, um, and I saw a clip, I mean, a, a short video that you did where you use the vid uh, the audio f uh, from your, um, ¿cómo le dicen a eso? The a trial. Uh, uh, the trial, yeah. the oh, trial yeah. where you are, they're accepting that they got something wrong, but in fact, you're the ones who's at fault. Mm -hmm. um, and you use all sorts of animation on top of that voice. Um, yeah, but basically. También, in this moment, there are many tensions after the death of Fidel, because there is a vacío of power, o sea, de, de authority, sobre todo. O sea, el gobierno tiene poder, pero al no existir el líder, entonces hay mucha confusión. There's a lot of tension after Fidel's death because there's an, uh, a vacuum um, in terms of leadership. Uh, and so people are afraid. There's, there, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of tension in terms of what to do. Y afortunadamente para nosotros, eh, no, o sea, no nos sentimos solos porque hay muchos artistas trabajando de manera independiente, no solo en el cine, sino artistas visuales. Y ahí se ha generado un movimiento eh, que eh, ha venido a ser más fuerte después de un decreto ley uh -huh. 349, que es el, el número del decreto, o sea que 
eh, pretende abolir el, el arte independiente. So there's, um, there's, we don't feel alone because there are other artists who are working independently, uh, painters, um, musicians, mm -hmm. uh, people working in theater, writers, uh, other filmmakers um, who are also, you know, sort of behind and working independently to um, respond to this kind of tense environment of censorship. And um, there is a decree, uh, number 349, uh, which is part of a new constitutional um, moment, a new constitutional practice. And I, I'll just quote um, that, the con that the, what it tries to do, this decree, presumably it tries to prevent discrimination mm -hmm. um, uh, in the arts, mm -hmm. but in fact what it's doing is exactly the opposite. And so one of the things it tries to regulate is what is vulgar and bad taste, in intrusive and mediocre. Um, and, and there has been a tremendous outcry, um, a re tremendous critical response from internationally from the artist community mm -hmm. and from within Cuba. And I, I read somewhere that they are saying they're not going to immediately apply the whole thing, but, but it was stated mm -hmm. in such a way that, that it was, you know, it was sort of maybe a little bit now, maybe a little bit. The, but the, the irony is that they, are, they, they were implementing it already for the last three or four years oh. with actions like this police raid. In a way, they are, what they're trying to do is get a legal ground for all these activities to go uh, without any red flag. And there was something and, that, that I thought was really interesting, which was that um, it, the way that they're saying is that it's for institutions where, or for individuals who are not legally, um, <coughs> wait, they're not legally defined, Same. right? Their work is not legally defined within, the con within their work parameters or something. And so I immediately thought the filmmakers, right? Because production mm -hmm. is not, a, it's an entity, a legal entity mm. yet, right, for individuals. Yes. And so it, it's this very kind of confusing and murky environment, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's, it's the sense that you can't publicly um, do things that would be in bad taste. Yeah, but however, there's something very revealing about all the uh, dots, uh, points that this decree has, and that's a, it refers to everything as a service or a transaction. Meaning that there is always some kind of commercial activity, and for them, art is not is is something that is a business uh, automatically. So this idea from the 1960s that art was meant to be for the enrichment and of the soul has nothing to do with this new law, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I know that this you know that you both really felt. Um, the consequences of, of not only just the tension, but of really working independently. Even you're not affiliated with an, with an entity, you're not taking money from an, any of these entities, um, and yet, right, you're mm -hmm. still, people, people are prevented from coming into your home or into a place that's um, showing something that you're working on and the theater piece that you did together that you directed mm. and you were in where you're behind these bars I mean it's quite directly and quite hard-hitting and it's and it's about all of this right and and that met with resistance as well from what mm. I understand right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, no lo que pasa es que ahora como eh, lo que hace el decreto o sea, ha hecho que uno tenga que volverse más creativo porque, eh, y también eh, trabajamos una obra de teatro en noviembre del año pasado, que lo que hicimos fue una intervención en el espacio público, porque ya que el espacio privado lo convierten en, en público uh -huh, y uh -huh. es ilegal, entonces decidimos intervenir las ruinas de las escuelas de arte. Hicimos una nueva obra. Right, ok. Um, so, um, one of the things, the response to the decree, this 349, is of course you have to be more creative, and since the private space of the home has been turned into a public space, you know, with this kind of response from the police, um, then we have decided to take over public spaces um, to do uh, interventions, and they did this at the Cuban uh, art schools, mm -hmm. which are these historic uh, schools from the 1960s. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, Las Ruinas. and yeah, the ruins of that mm -hmm. school. You were you were talking about um, the documentary of the schools. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, and y, y qué, 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 qué hicieron en las ruinas? Una nueva obra de teatro. Oh, so they did another theater, a new theater piece in the sobre ruins la of the school. De conciencia. Sobre la los prisioneros de conciencia. About prisoners of conscience. So <coughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, the film we're working on now for seven years, uh, which we're going to be showing tomorrow, by the way, the first <laughs> hour we have completed. At what time? At six. At six. At so six. yes, if you want to come back. So, um, it, and uh, I think this is great because, you know, you always do this uh, of showing your work in progress and it is a fantastic experience to see the thing take shape over all these years. But, uh, <laughs> but that, that film is made also, uh, the big problem is whenever we shoot outdoors because we have to shoot without permits and the minute that you put a tripod, even if it's just two people, uh, you have to study the location really well right. and when you go you have to do it uh, fast. Uh, because that's uh, depending on whether it's a main street or not, or if there are important buildings around, some a policeman might come and ask what you're doing, and and we do it without a permit, so that's always an issue. So the project that you're working on next, which is called Blue Heart, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that we're going to show some footage tomorrow, and, and that you can talk about mm -hmm. and share with whoever's here. Um, we're going to do that at six o'clock, but it's a story of genetic engineering. And, um, An experiment that Fidel Castro does to build a new man to okay. save socialism, and of course the experiment goes wrong. And uh, all these people join forces and create an, an anarchist band that starts to overthrow the regime, which is in that alternative reality very similar to China. They still call it communism, but behind the facade it's a brutal capitalism. And so, and, and one scene was shot right here in Santa Barbara. Yes, there's a shot there that you'll see it tomorrow. <laughs> in a laboratory right here in Goleta. Yeah. So, anyway, thank you, Miguel and Lynn, for coming and sharing this with us. Welcome.